Okay, I think we can start. So, um, let me check the video recording, okay. Um, so, today we will learn together um, what is a design pattern and how can we use design patterns to, to guide the design process of our solutions. Just to recap, we started this course with uh, need finding, that is the process through which we can extract the needs of our users, through which we can reason about the problem and start reasoning about the main features of our, our solution and the tasks that our, our solution will, will solve. Now we are starting to uh, prototype something, so we have seen low fidelity prototypes, um, and we will also see medium and high fidelity prototypes. And then in the next lectures, uh, we will see how we can evaluate our prototypes, our implementation, for example, with uh, heuristic evaluations. But right now we are, I would say, in the core of this course, uh, because we are starting to, to implement something. And so design patterns are a tool that can simplify this, this process. Uh, I think you have already seen this slide. You have already seen some tools to simplify the design process. Um, so theories, principles, and, and guidelines, right? Um, so theories are the most abstract. They don't tell you uh, what to do, but they describe uh, how to do things uh, and, for example, how users behave. Um, so that we can design our systems according, for example, to the abilities of, of the users, right? And an example here is the Norman model. So uh, the Norman model describes how users and the digital system may interact uh, from a theoretical point of view. Then we have principles that are uh, more concrete with respect to um, theories, but still less concrete with respect to, to guidelines. Um, so an example here are the eight golden rules of uh, interface design. And then we have guidelines that are low-level advice um, that tell us how we should implement our, our solutions. And typically guidelines are linked uh, with a given domain. For example, we have uh, the guidelines from Microsoft Research about human-AI interaction. So a set of 18 guidelines on how to develop interactive systems that allows users to interact with uh, an AI-based system, okay? So what about design patterns and what are the differences between design patterns and theories, principles, and guidelines? Um, I think that uh, the main difference is that uh, these three ingredients are independent from the problem that you are trying to solve uh, and from the solutions that you are trying to, to implement. Uh, especially theories and principles uh, can be applied, can be used uh, every time you need to design an interactive system. Then guidelines, uh, okay, are linked with a specific domain, but you can use them uh, for any possible problems inside this given domain. Design patterns are instead uh, more linked to a specific problem and to a specific solution. And this is the first generic definition of today. So design patterns are well-proven uh, well solutions that solve commonly recurring problems. So here we have uh, two main things in the definition. Uh, a problem that is common inside a given domain and a given solution. So these patterns suggest a specific solution for a specific problem, a solution that has been tested by others in the past and that has been proved to be successful for solving the problem, okay? So we have a problem. We know that this problem has been addressed before, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can adopt a solution that has been already tested by others, by others developers, by others uh, designers, okay? 
And in this way, obviously, solutions can be reused. This is the main characteristic of, of design patterns. So why do we need this kind of, of patterns? Uh, design is about solution, right? Designing something is uh, designing a solution for solving a given problem. But unfortunately, designers, and in particular developers, uh, often reinvent things, okay? So there is a problem, I reinvent a solution from scratch. Even if this problem is, is very common inside, of the, inside a given domain. Uh, unfortunately, reinventing things means that then it's hard to know, for example, how things were done before, or why things were done in a given way. And obviously, if we reinvent a solution every time, then it's hard to reuse solutions. And here is, is why the concept of design pattern is important. This concept was uh, first used by uh, Christopher Alexander, that was an architect. So this concept of design patterns originated from the architectural field. Um, and Alexander defined uh, design patterns in this way. Each pattern describes a problem that occurs over and over again in our environment, and then describes the core of the solution to that problem. So two important things. The problem inside a given environment, so the context is important here, and the core of a solution. Uh, so a design pattern uh, doesn't include uh, technical details, doesn't tell you how to exactly implement a solution, it tells you the core of the solution, so that you can use this solution a million times over without ever doing it the same way twice, okay? And this book from Ale by Alexander uh, is actually a collection of uh, hundreds of design patterns for urban problems, so problems that may arise, for example, in building a city or a house. And we will see some examples. So again, design patterns are a way to communicate common problems and related solutions. Uh, and again, they are not too general and not too specific, so they don't include any technical details. Um, so you can follow the solution by implementing the solution, for example, in different languages with different uh, strategies and techniques. They can be seen as a shared language. So they can, they can be a standard reference point for, for designers. And as they are uh, generic, you can implement many different uh, uh, implementations for uh, following this, this solution. So they allow for debate over alternatives. And they are also, they are also typically readable by non-experts. We can also see design patterns as a new uh, literary form. What is a literary form? It's uh, an agreement uh, between the writer and the reader. So a classical example here is, is a letter, OK? So a letter always starts with, for example, the date, and then dear Bob, blah, blah, blah. And then the letter ends typically with some letter closing, like best regards and my signature, OK? So if a writer gives you a letter, the writer can assume that you already understand the pattern, the, the format of a letter, a sort of agreement. So we can think about design patterns as a new form of literary form. So they define certain things to be in certain place with a certain meaning. So how we can describe uh, design patterns and how they are described in literature. So this is an example taken from the book uh, by Alexander. So it's a design pattern uh, in the architectural field. And Alexander uh, describe each pattern in this way. So first there is a name with some introductory images. Um, and the important thing about names is that the names of uh, design patterns are typically in common language, okay? To inspire designers and users to adopt these, these patterns. 
and also because, uh, as I said before, design patterns must be readable by non-experts. So in this case, for example, sitting wall, we can easily imagine what is this dark, dark, uh, design pattern, sorry, a wall on which we can uh, sit on, right? Then there is some, some context. Uh, so as I said before, the context is important because not all the design patterns are useful in all the contexts. We will see later in this lesson that we have some design patterns for designing websites that can be displayed on large screen, like a desktop uh, computer. And then there are other patterns that are suitable for mobile application development. Okay? So the context is, is important. Then we have the problem statement that describes the problem. In this case, for example, in many places, walls and fences between outdoor spaces are too high, but no boundary at all, blah, blah, blah. Okay? It describes the problem. Then we have some examples of solutions, so how designers, architecture in this case, have solved this problem before. And finally, we have the solution statement, okay? The core of the design pattern. In this case, surround any natural outdoor area and make minor boundaries between outdoor areas with low walls about 16 inches high and wide enough to sit on, okay? The solution with some, maybe, diagrams, and finally, some possible references to other patterns. So how this pattern can be linked with, with other uh, design patterns. Okay, this is the general structure of a design pattern that is also adopted in, in different, in different contexts and in, in different domains. So we can also see design patterns as a tool to balance uh, forces. So design patterns solve a problem of conflicting forces, typically. So an example. Um, we know that uh, people are naturally drawn uh, towards light, but people also like to see it. So imagine in this room there is a window there and some seats here in the middle of the room. So when I enter the room, I'm sort of, I have two conflicting needs. I would like to sit down, but I'm also naturally drawn towards light, okay? So there is this sort of conflicting needs. And design patterns are a way to solve these this conflicting needs. For example, this is the Alexander window seat pattern that uh, solves these two con uh, conflicting needs. So having uh, seats uh, directly inside a window. And it's a design pattern that is still adopted in building houses, for example, okay? Obviously, these conflicting forces can be of different types. In this case, they are, I would say, biological needs, but we can also have, for example, uh, conflicting forces in the economical fields, for example, and, and so on. And obviously, uh, sometimes a design pattern uh, need to find a trade-off between these, these conflicting needs. So, the concept originated from the architectural field, but starting from these very important pieces of work, and in particular the book User-Centered System Design by Donald Norman and The Design of Everyday Things by the same author, um, the concept uh, uh, started to gain interest also in the human-computer interaction field. So architecture describes physical environments in which uh, people need to live in. Uh, XCI describes virtual environments uh, in which people can, can interact. So there is a connection between the two, the two fields. And typically, uh, design patterns in XCI are design patterns for uh, designing user interfaces. So, obviously, each user interface is unique. It has its own set of goal and data. But this doesn't mean that we should force users to learn every time how to use our, our applications from scratch. So, with this kind of UI design patterns, we can simplify the process. We can help users understand how to use our, our websites, our mobile applications. 
And before starting to see some examples, I would like to show you this very useful uh, website, uipatterns.com, that is a good starting point to start exploring this kind of, of patterns. It includes uh, a lot of examples of UI design patterns. Uh, so they are divided by category. So we have some design patterns for getting input. So design patterns, for example, to be used inside forms. We have some design patterns for navigation. Uh, so menus, for example. Some design patterns for dealing with data, uh, like tables and so on. We also have some design patterns that are called persuasive design patterns. Uh, these are design patterns that can be used to force users to perform a given choice in our, in our application, in our interface. Uh, we will see some examples at the end of this lecture. You may imagine that these kind of patterns may become problematic for the end user perspective, but we will see some examples later. OK, let's go back to the traditional UI design patterns. For example, if I open, uh, uh, I don't know, pagination, the pagination pattern, we can see that uh, the website opens a new page with all the details of this pattern. And we can also see that this structure is very similar. Uh, you cannot see it, sorry. No. OK. So this is the, the home page. We have this category of design patterns. And if I click on an example, like pagination, we can see that there is a page with all the details of this pattern. And the structure of this page is quite similar to the one adopted by Alexander. So we have uh, the problem summary, we have some examples, we have a solution statement, and so on. Okay, and we can. There are also some advice on when to use this this pattern and when not. Okay. So let's go back to the slides. And this is uh, a list of uh, design patterns. A uh, very small list, actually of UI design patterns that can be uh, used on different uh, devices in this case, OK? So they are generic design patterns that, can, that are typically used both on uh, mobile applications, for example, and websites. And the first one is the accordion menu, OK? So an accordion menu is a menu um, on which there are these uh, top level items that can be expanded and collapsed when the user click on on these on these items okay so for example here if i click on this link in your drive my drive then the menu expand a sub list of folders in this case and if i click again on on the top level item the sub folders uh, are collapsed and disappear behind the top level item. Of course, I can use this menu uh, when I have some limitation in space. So when I don't want to display too many details in the menu, but I still want to uh, give the user the possibility to browse all, all, the, all the possibilities. Okay? So we have this kind of menus that can be expanded and, and collapsed. Obviously, if I go to the website and I search for accordion menu, let's, here we are, in the menu category, there is this page with, if you need more details on this, on this pattern, more examples, you can, you can use this, this page. So for example, the advice is to use this pattern when you want the benefits of a normal sidebar menu, but 
uh, you don't have the space to list all the options. Uh, okay. Then we have the drop-down menu that is similar to the accordion menu. The difference here is that there is only one, one element, one icon, one item, that you can click to open uh, a list of sub-items. So again, if I click on Il Mio Drive, my drive, then the interface uh, shows me all the sub-elements uh, of, of the menu. Similarly, here we have uh, an icon. This is the notification icon on uh, YouTube. So if I click on the icon, YouTube shows me in a drop-down menu all my notifications on, on the platform, okay? So obviously, before adopting a given design pattern, you should always um, think about the data you need to display. For example, having a drop-down menu with a very limited set of items, like two or three items, is, uh, is weird. Uh, instead, having a drop-down menu with millions of elements, probably it's not a good option, because the user, if the user needs to select a given item, the user must uh, search in a very long uh, list of items. So you should also reason about the information that you need to display before deciding which pattern to, to adopt. We also have cards that are uh, a design pattern to uh, structure the layout of our uh, interfaces. Um, so uh, you can use cards when you need to display a list of different information, uh, a list of different items, and when each item is actually a complex information. So each item requires some text, for example, some buttons, some images. Here, for example, is uh, a screenshot taken from If This Then That. I don't know if you are familiar with this platform. It's uh, a platform for trigger action programming. So with this platform, you can personalize the behavior of your different devices and services connected to the internet. For example, I can define a trigger action rule like, I don't know, if I receive a notification on Facebook, then blink the Philips Hue lamp in the kitchen, okay? Here, each card represents a rule, okay? So each card is a rule, and if I click on one of these rules, the website opens, obviously, a dedicated page for the rule uh, on which I can, for example, modify the rule, delete the rule, and, and so on. So cards are used to uh, structure the uh, layout of our interfaces when we have a set of items to, to display, a set of complex uh, items to display. Uh, if we go on its page on uipatterns.com, um, here we have also some, some rationale and some advice on when to use card and when we shouldn't use cards. For example, uh, we shouldn't use cards when uh, we have a strict order in which we want to uh, display the elements because card layouts typically de-emphasize ranking of content and they don't provide obvious information about the order in which the elements are displayed. So, if we need a strict order, then cards probably are not a good idea. Okay, we then have uh, breadcrumbs. Uh, I think they are less common than the previous ones, but anyway, uh, we probably experienced them before. Um, breadcrumbs can be used to highlight uh, uh, two things. One is uh, the current page on which the user is on. For example, in the first breadcrumb here, the user is on the payment page. On the second breadcrumb, the user is here in the shipping page, okay? It's a navigation uh, pattern. Besides highlighting the current page, it also highlights the navigation history of the user 
inside a given session. Okay? So each word here is actually a link of a previous interaction of the user with the page. So uh, the breadcrumb highlights how the user has reached the payment page in this, in this session. And it also offers an easy way to go back to a previous, to a previous page. It's common in e-commerce websites uh, because it models all the procedure that you need to, to buy something. And the last example here is the hamburger button. Uh, the name is hamburger because, as you may imagine, it resembles a hamburger with the two slices of bread with, with something in the middle. Um, it's similar to a drop-down menu. So when the user click on a hamburger, something appears on the screen, like a menu, a navigation drawer, OK? And the typical example is uh, the hamburger in the navbar of the websites. Um, for example, don't know if you are familiar with uh, Bootstrap, that is a, fra a CSS framework for uh, building responsive websites. So if I go on the documentation of Bootstrap and I look for the navigation element, the navbar element here, we have some examples of a navbar uh, implemented with, with Bootstrap. Okay, this is an example of a navbar of a hypothetical website. As you can see, the navbar now it's in its uh, in its normal configuration. So it's a navbar that could be displayed uh, on a laptop PC. But if I resize the page, as you can see, all the links and the form, the search form that were previously present in the navbar, have collapsed behind uh, an hamburger menu. Okay. So the hamburger menu is used to collapse these items uh, behind the, the click of the user because we don't have enough space here to show all, all the elements. So we use a hamburger uh, design pattern to develop this responsive uh, navbar. OK. Any questions? So as I said at the beginning of this lesson, the context is important for design patterns. These were uh, a list of uh, design patterns that can be used uh, in several interfaces. Uh, so both, for example, on uh, uh, mobile applications and uh, websites. Then there are some design patterns that are uh, specific to a, given, to a given context, and for example, to mobile applications, and in particular here to Android mobile applications. Okay? So this is a list of design patterns that are commonly used in, in Android applications. So the first example is the toolbar. That is a standard way to present uh, titles uh, and actions in your application. Okay? They typically have a standard height and they are divided in three main parts. So on the left, there is the navigation part, so some buttons, icons to allow users to uh, navigate in your mobile application. Here, for example, there is this left arrow, so probably, sorry, by clicking on this left arrow, uh, I can go back to the previous screen, right? Then there is the title here in the middle. And then on the right, there are a list of uh, buttons that represent actions. So actions that I can perform with my application. Um, so in this case, probably I can search something in the current screen. I can like something. And then there is also this overflow menu it is a sort of uh, drop-down menu. Uh, so with the overflow menu, I can have multiple actions uh, collapsed behind 
the, the given icon so that I don't have to put all the actions directly in the, in the toolbar. We also have the app bar that is, I would say, a special case of the toolbar. It's the toolbar of the application in general, and it is placed at the very top of the application, at the very top of the screen. Uh, also in this case, the structure is, th is the same. So we have the title here, the actions button on the right, and some navigation uh, possibility here on the left. In this case, there is this hamburger again. So as you can see, this is an example of usage of the hamburger pattern inside the hub bar. And the hamburger, typically in Android, um, opens uh, a navigation drawer. That is another pattern that we will see in a minute. OK, another example are tabs that are used to uh, organize and navigate to different sections within our application. Okay? Um, so each tab represents a given part of our, of our application, a given screen. Uh, on Android tabs uh, always appear uh, inside the, the app bar. Okay? So here tabs are included in a hub bar. And you can swipe between, between tabs by swiping horizontally, OK? So swiping horizontally means moving between, between tabs. As I said before, this is the navigation drawer that is uh, typically opened by clicking on the hamburger icon of the app bar. So the navigation drawer is a, is a panel that appears from, from the left of the screen. Um, and it may contain uh, two things, mainly. Some navigation options, for example, a list of links for reaching the different pages of your application. Uh, and it may also contain some account information, like the profile image, the button for login, the button for logout, and so on. Obviously, if you only have a few sections to navigate in your application, then using tabs is probably better uh, because uh, the sections are directly visible on the screen. But if you have multiple sections on your app, then uh, probably you would need to use uh, a navigation drawer. And finally, uh, Scrolling and paging. These are two, I would say, interactive design patterns. So Android has very common patterns around scrolling and paging. Uh, vertical scrolling, in particular, can be used uh, to consume more content. For example, when you start browsing your Instagram news feed, uh, you can uh, swipe down to, to load more content to see more posts. Um, horizontal scrolling is instead uh, less common, and it's typically used to switch between different pages. Uh, for example, in tabs, you can uh, swipe horizontally to move between, between tabs. OK? So this was uh, a list of examples of uh, generic patterns UI patterns and specific UI patterns for Android development. Any questions about uh, design patterns in general? OK. As I mentioned at the beginning of this lesson, um, OK, we use design patterns to simplify the design process of our solutions, right? So in general, design patterns are a useful tool for helping designers and developers and so on. Um, 
However, in some cases, uh, design patterns, and in particular UI design patterns, uh, can become uh, what is called dark patterns. And I mentioned this before uh, talking about persuasive design patterns. So design patterns that can be used to force the user to perform a given choice inside, inside uh, our application, our interface. Obviously, um, if the interest of the developer and of the tech company in general is the same of the interest of the user, that's perfectly fine. You can use persuasive design patterns uh, without any particular problem. Uh, the problem is when the interest of the designer and of the tech company is in conflict with the interest of the user, okay? And this is the case of, of dark patterns. So deceptive designs that can go against the user best interest. So the term dark pattern was coined in 2010 by Eric Brignull, that is a design, uh, with a design practitioner. And the aim of Brignull was to include, to collect all those designs that are deliberately, and here the word deliberately is important, that are consciously adopted by designers, developers, uh, to promote choices that are not in the user best interest. So this figure summarizes uh, the traditional concept of, of dark patterns. There is uh, a definition here on the top. Uh, so dark patterns are tricks that make the users do things they didn't want to. Okay? Um, obviously, there is a fine line between influencing user behavior and tricking them. And this is the reason why uh, dark patterns, from the designer perspective, uh, can work in the short term, but using dark patterns as a negative impact in the long term, because probably users will uh, switch to more ethical products. Okay? However, uh, using dark patterns in the short term also have negative effects on, on users, on users themselves. And we will see some, some examples later. So researchers and practitioners um, have traditionally focused on dark patterns that lead to financial and privacy harms, okay? So for example, uh, the original patterns proposed by Brignull include a sneak into basket. That is a pattern through which e-commerce websites uh, add some items to your shopping cart, even if you didn't select these items. So for example, uh, I'm buying a smartphone, okay? I'm ready to pay, and I notice that the platform has added a protection cover to my shopping cart. And if I'm not focused on, on, the, on the web page, the risk is that I will buy two items instead of one, okay? This is a very common uh, pattern, at least in some uh, e-commerce websites. Um, another example here, uh, this time related to privacy, is privacy zuckering, that are user interfaces that tricks users uh, into unintentionally sharing private information. As you can see from this figure, also in this case, uh, the names of these patterns are in common language. So for example, you can easily guess what this pattern privacy zuckering means and who is the subject of, of, this, of this pattern. So the founder of, of Facebook, obviously. So Brignull published uh, a gallery of, of dark patterns on this website. And he collected these dark patterns by launching a Hall of Shame campaign on Twitter using this, uh, this uh, hashtag uh, dark patterns. And I think the, sorry, the website is really interesting. It includes some, some definition of, of dark patterns, some videos. Um, it includes some, a reading list, the Hall of Shame uh, section, and here, you can see the list of uh, traditional dark patterns that have been collected by Brignull. Um, and if you click 
uh, on an example, you can, you can have more details. For example, uh, here, the snake into basket, uh, it provides you some, some examples, some screenshots, uh, and the definition of, of this kind of, of dark pattern. Okay? Just a few words about terminology. So as you probably know, um, in computer science, uh, many organizations are now moving away from uh, oppressive terminology. Uh, for example, from master-slave to parent-child, uh, or from blacklist to blocklist. Uh, in the case of dark patterns, obviously, there is a problem here, the association with uh, dark and, and harm, the harm produced by this, these patterns. Uh, so this associ association may reinforce uh, a racist heuristic, the so-called bad is black effect. So there are nowadays uh, alternative names for dark patterns as well, like deceptive designs. The same brick new changed uh, his website from darkpatterns.com to deceptive.design and now uses uh, the term deceptive design instead of uh, dark patterns. Uh, one term is deceptive design, the other term, the other possibility is damaging patterns. And in the last part of this lesson, I would like to introduce you to <coughs> a very specific kind of dark patterns that is uh, strictly linked with one of the topics that we are addressing in this course, at least with some, some groups, that is digital well-being. Um, so these specific kind of dark patterns are attention capture damaging patterns. So, design patterns that are deliberately adopted by tech companies to capture the attention of the user. So in the digital well-being topic, uh, I think the main question is why is, why is our digital well-being undermined by contemporary technology? And one of the reasons here is that most of the contemporary tech companies follow uh, a business model that is called the attention economy. So in the attention economy, you probably know that you can use uh, most of the social networks for free. The reality here is that our attention is transformed into a currency, okay? So we pay for a service uh, with the time we spend on it, okay? And the problem is that tech companies may sell our attention and unfortunately also our data sometimes, if you remember the Cambridge Analytica scandal, uh, to advertising companies, okay? So we pay for a service with the time we spend on it and tech companies sell our attention, our data to advertisement, uh, uh, advertising companies. Obviously, this business model is convenient from the point of view of the tech companies. For example, Alphabet, that is the company that owns Google, is worth $1, uh, $1 trillion. Meta, which owns Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, is worth about uh, $700 uh, billion. And the result is that the time we spend on digital devices and on the internet in general, and also the interaction between users and these digital services is continuously, continuously growing, okay? These charts represent, um, summarize what happens uh, in a minute on the internet in 2020 and in 2021. And if we compare the two charts, we can see that time, interactions, uh, like clicks, shares, tweets, with these social networks, video streaming platforms, are continuously, continuously growing. And one of the reasons is that um, this is by design. So uh, tech company adopt design to capture user attention. So what are attention capture damaging patterns? So they are recurring pattern in a digital interface 
that a designer, also in this case, deliberately use um, to capture the attention of the user. And to do so, um, to do this kind of attention capture, designers exploit the psychological vulnerabilities of the user. Um, and we will see some, some examples. Obviously, this has negative impacts on the users. Um, for example, users may lose track of their goals, uh, may lose their sense of time and control. So, uh, OK, I should work, I should study, but I still continue to use Facebook. And also, uh, after a very long session on Facebook, I often experience a later feel of regret. Okay? So there are a set of negative impacts that these kind of patterns may have on, on users. The goal of these patterns is to, is, sorry, to maximize continuous usage, daily visits, and, and interactions like clicks, shares, likes, and so on. And so they make users more, more likely to visit a digital service again. So they create a sort of trap for the user by offering some, some reward to the user. So some strategies adopted inside this, these patterns. Typically, these patterns remove the need for autonomous decision making. So they simplify the interaction. They automatize the process uh, that I need to interact with, with, the, with the interface. And there is a paradox here, obviously. They can improve the usability of the system, but with the hidden goal of keeping the user on the platform. And also, these kind of patterns may exploit the psychological vulnerabilities of the user. So these are two examples. They offer variable reward, so they uh, implement variable rewarding systems. For example, uh, if I'm scrolling my Facebook news feed, I cannot know if the posts that I will see uh, will be exciting, will be interesting to me. So I'm always looking for new content to be consumed, hoping for new exciting content to, to consume. And another example is immediate gratification. So the gratification that I receive, for example, when, when I receive a like on my, on my photos on Instagram. So as I said, these patterns exploit psychological vulnerabilities and also cognitive biases. What is a cognitive bias? It's a systematic error in thinking that may occur when people are processing and interpreting information in the world uh, and this systematic error affects the decisions and judgments uh, that the user can make. Okay? And there is an example here of a cognitive bias. So obviously what we perceive as true depends on the context in which we see it. Now, this is a question for you. If I ask you what is the color of the two blocks here, block A and block B, What's the color of the two blocks? So the first block is dark gray, right? The second block, the block B, light gray. OK, this is a classical example of a cognitive bias. Because if I now add some context to this figure by drawing these two lines, we can easily see that the two blocks are actually of the same color, OK? So we have just experienced a cognitive bias. And if I remove the context, still our brain is probably not able to understand that the two blocks are of the same color, OK? So it's a cognitive bias. It's a systematic error of our brain. If I add some context, I can now understand that the two blocks have the same color. This is named the Checkers, shadows, sorry for the pronunciation, illusion. Obviously, this was a visual cognitive bias, but we can have many different biases, not only visual, but also of different kinds. So 
these patterns exploit this kind of biases um, and, and vulnerabilities that can be of various type. Some examples. Uh, notifications with their vibrations, flashing LEDs, uh, mimic uh, danger, uh, signals that we may experience in our offline uh, life, for example. Uh, the possibility of receiving new comments or messages or likes keep us in a persistent state of alert. And this is the variable reward technique. And it, it is also demonstrated that every time we receive a comment or a like on our photos, our brain gets a dose of dopamine, prompting us to compare ourselves with, with others. This is the social influence technique. And in general, the digital interfaces, uh, especially social networks, video streaming platforms, uh, are designed to keep us engaged, okay? Mixing together uh, old and new content each time we interact with this kind of, of interfaces. And this is a mechanism that is also used by slot machines, for example. As I said before, this has several negative impacts on the digital well-being of, of users. So obviously, these patterns may promote digital addiction, um, and they also undermine the attention, obviously, of the users and, and the productivity, OK? So I should study, but I, I still be uh, I interrupted by, by Facebook, by Instagram. They also undermine the user's sense of agency and self-control. Um, and as I said before, they often result in a later sense of, of regret. So some uh, example of these kind of, of patterns. Guilty pleasure recommendations. And here is an example taken from, from Facebook, and in particular from the watch section of Facebook. So the watch section of Facebook is continuously offering the user with some recommended video to be watched without any particular uh, strategy, OK? So in general, recommendations are a useful uh, tool uh, that can help users to interact with, with, a, with a system. Um, they can be based on uh, my previous interaction with the system, and this is, these are the content-based recommendation systems. They can also be based on the preferences of similar users, uh, and this is the case of collaborative filtering recommendation systems. And again, in general, recommendations are useful uh, when the goal of the platform matches the goal of the user, the so-called value alignment problem. However, they can become a trap for the user um, to capture the user attention and keeping it on the platform against the user will, OK? And this is the case of the, the watch section of, of Facebook that provides you with uh, an infinite number of viral videos to be, to be consumed. And as we will see, uh, most of these patterns ex exploit a variable reward technique. So also in this case, I cannot predict if the next video will be interesting to me, it will be exciting, so I continue to watch video hoping for new interesting content. Never ending out to play. Uh, and here the problem is in the never ending world. Here is an example taken from YouTube. Uh, so the next video is automatically played when the previous video ends without any user interaction. Okay? And this continues every time. So a new video is automatically played. Uh, and the problem here is that there is never a point for the user to stop and reflect. And also, in these systems, not on YouTube actually, sorry, in these systems, the option to turn off the autoplay is typically hidden or non existent. Uh, not on YouTube, because on YouTube you have a slider uh, below each video through which you can easily enable or disable the autoplay. 
But in other systems, this feature is, is hidden or non-existent. Again, and this is common to all these kind of patterns, autoplay may be useful in some circumstances, like um, listening to music on YouTube while working, for example. But in general, it can prolong usage sessions. So again, there is this variable reward technique, and it also reduces the user autonomy. So in a way, it simplifies the interaction, but uh, so it, it improves the usability of the, of the platform, of the interface. But if the goal, if the interest of the user uh, is in conflict with the interest of the platform itself, uh, this kind of pattern can become a problem for, for the user. Casino pull to refresh. Uh, and this is an example of the mobile application of Instagram. So with casino pull to refresh, that is common obviously on smartphones, uh, where you can pull an interface, um, there is this sort of animated pull to refresh through which you can manually reload the, the status of the application. I don't know if you have already experienced this pattern. Uh, I think I experience it every day. So I start browsing my newsfeed of Instagram or Facebook. Then after a while, I start seeing posts that I have already seen previously in a previous interaction. So I quickly go back to the top of my interface and I pull the interface to see if there are new, new contents, new posts in the timeline, okay? So when the user swipes down the smartphone, there is a, an animated reload of the page that may or may not, and this is the problem, reveal new appealing content. Again, variable reward technique. I cannot uh, assume that there will be new posts to consume, maybe, maybe not. So users, as a result, may be tempted to refresh compulsively, hoping to receive new, new content. And this is also a mechanism that is adopted in, in slot machines. And finally, uh, infinite scrolling. So as you know, all the contemporary social networks can be scrolled infinitely both on the computer and on the website and on the mobile application. So as long as the user scroll down a page, more content automatically and continuously uh, loads at the bottom. So this decreases the effort required to, to browse the content. So again, it's a mechanism that can simplify interaction, that can be useful in some circumstances but it also promotes endless usage sessions, especially when it is mixed with, uh, for example, algorithms in social networks that decide what you should see in a given moment, okay? And also in this case, there is this variable reward technique, so uh, I, cannot, uh, I cannot assume that the next post will be uh, interesting or, or not. Okay, any questions? So thinking about your current experience with your devices and smartphones, do you have any other examples of possible attention capture uh, damaging patterns? Okay, something that uh, I think here there are two possible um, patterns. One is, one is called the time fog pattern. It's a pattern that uh, try to hide uh, the time on your interface. So for example, in some mobile games, 
um, the clock on your smartphone is automatically hidden by, by, the, by the platform um, to remove awareness of time for the user. And the other is using time to give this sense of urgency. Okay, so I visualize a timer to uh, encourage the user to perform a given choice before the time, the time ends. Okay, so these were two examples of, of attention capture damaging patterns, yeah. Other examples? As I mentioned before, also uh, the possibility of receiving likes and comments uh, and all the social metrics that we can uh, that we can have on contemporary social networks may become a, an attention capture of that pattern because uh, there is this social influence uh, problem. So I'm forced to compare myself with others, hoping to receive more more likes, more comments. So. I probably will apply many different filters to my, to my photos just to receive more likes. And this could be another example of a problematic pattern in this, in this context. OK. So here you have some, some references, if you want. And to conclude the lesson, um, as you probably know, we have just published the assignment number four that is online. Sorry. Here we are. So the goal of the assignment number four is first to uh, reason on the feedback that you received for, for the assignment number three. Okay, so you should quickly sketch some revisions of your paper prototypes according to the feedback that you received. And then the core of this assignment is to translate this, the low level fidelity prototype that you selected into a medium fidelity prototype. Okay, and to do so, you will use um, a tool. Okay, uh, we recommend Figma. And uh, uh, after this lesson, I will upload on, on YouTube and on the website also um, an online lecture on, on Figma that you can use to learn how to use this, this specific tool. Okay, uh, so if you want, you can uh, watch the lecture uh, about Figma and use this tool for, for your medium fidelity prototype. However, if you are familiar with other tools like Balsamic or Marvel, you can also use them. The important thing is that you produce a medium fidelity prototype that should be obviously without colors, so still in a gray scale. Um, it will still uh, display the main screens of your applications only, so we can assume that the trivial steps like login uh, are already done by the user. Uh, so the medium fidelity prototype needs to uh, convey the goal of each page. So uh, you will include all, all the buttons with all the specific text. And also you will add interactivity so that if a user click on a button, the prototype automatically shows uh, another page of the application, for example. Uh, after creating the uh, medium fidelity prototype, you need to set up the interactive prototype for the heuristic evaluation that will be assignment number five. So in assignment number five that we will publish in these days, uh, you will give your prototype to another person um, and this person will evaluate this prototype following a given checklist. Okay? So, in preparing the medium fidelity prototype, be sure that the evaluators can access the prototype from a public link. In Figma, there is the possibility to publish the prototype, to, to share the link of your prototype with, with someone else. 
And you should also prepare a readme file with the link and the three tasks that you defined in assignment three, because those three tasks will be the tasks that the evaluator will perform on your, on your prototype, okay? And for this assignment, uh, we will not have any feedback session, any specific feedback session with the slides and so on. So if you need feedback, please come to the lab and ask directly during the, the lab hours your feedback to, to, to your teacher, the teacher of the, of the slot. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so I think we can stop here. And if you have any particular questions about your project, uh, I'm here for the next uh, 10 minutes. Okay, thank you.